anyone figure out what is uh, the matter with this paradox that uh, no matter what you choose, it looks as if you switch, you can do better. What is the paradox there? Right, so what was the problem? The problem was someone tells you, uh, someone tells you, look, here are two boxes, right? And he opens one box and say there is $100, and he tells you that, in, that these two boxes contain, one contains certain amount of money and the other contains twice that amount of money. Right? You op he opens one box, it's a hundred dollars. And you are now given a choice, should you switch or should you stay with this? Well, the paradox is, you see, let's just to do it in a more general way, assume that it was X amount of money here. Then what is the expected value it is uh, of money in this box with probability one half the expected value is uh, so we, the value is uh, uh, 200 and with probability one half the value will be 50 so what is this this is a hundred plus 25 so this is a hundred twenty five so it looks like because the expected value here is larger, you should switch. But look, if you do it for x, right? If you do it for x, what is the expected value? It appears that the expected value is 1 half 2x plus 1 half x over 2, right? But this is x plus one quarter x, so this is uh, uh, 1.25 x. So if you choose, even if you didn't know what's inside, but you called it x, it appears the expected value here is larger. But now you can repeat the same arg argument for the value in this box it will appear that the expected value here will be 1.25, the value here. How is that possible? And should you switch or should you not switch? So what do you think? What is the paradox? What makes this problem paradoxical? You see... <laughs> Uh, the trick is uh, that the problem is actually meaningless. It's just abuse of uh, your intuition about probability. What is the meaningless here? This assumes, uh, when I say, uh, uh, here are two boxes, it's guaranteed that uh, the amount in one box is twice the amount of the other box. But this tacitly assumes that probability for any amount is the same, right? Because what does it mean when I say uh, there is a certain amount of money here and double the amount of money in the other box, right? And we computed this that the probability that this has double is uh, one half. But you see, this doesn't make sense because this would mean that all pairs, uh, x to x, are equally likely. But that's not possible because x can be a real number, right? So it's impossible to find this uniform distribution of x for all values of x. So the problem simply is playing with your intuition about probability. Now what happens uh, to make it possible? You have to discretize probability. So you can say, uh, 
assume that uh, the val possible values of money are 1 and 2, 2 and 4, uh, uh, 4 and 8, and so four up to, say, 2 to the 100 um, and 2 to the 101, right? Now, if I say all these possibilities are equally likely, we can, in fact, compute uh, the probability. So this is 0. Uh, the probability is uh, 1 over 101 for each of these pairs. Right? Because now we have finitely many possible values. OK, so now, if you repeat the experiment, if I told you I picked with equal probability one of these values, and in one box I put this, in the other box I put uh, twice as much. Uh, and you now open one box and say you find that uh, uh, this is 2 to the, whatever, say, 31 many dollars. Uh, should you switch or should you not switch? <laughs> it's a lot of money at play. Yeah. What do you think? When should you switch? Now, I am claiming when I open the box for you and show you, you have a piece of information. What piece of information do you have? You still don't know... For example, assume that I open a box and there is $16 there. So now, possibility is $8 in the other box or $32 in the other box. And lo and behold, with equal probability, one half, because all of these pairs were chosen with equal probability, so the pair 816 has the same probability as pair 1632. What is the information that you get? Uh, the hint is you should switch always except. Except when? Except if you get an odd number. Hmm? It's not a power of two. It is. All of them are powers of two because I told you they are all elements of this set. Huh? You switch unless you get zero and one. Exactly. You switch. You see, if you get one dollar, you know for sure the other box has two. You switch. The only situation when you don't switch is when you uh, get uh, that you have two to 101 many dollars because you know that the other is. Uh, now, if you draw anything else and you see what it is and you verify that it is not these n cases, you should switch because now this computation is valid, but the paradox uh, disappears, uh, right? So it's important to know when we say, we, you know, uh, what does it mean if I tell you I have certain amount of money, every amount with equal probability? Is this possible? Is this meaningful statement? Uh, you know, I can have, well, if you are a U.S. Uh, uh, Federal Reserve, then you have uh, unlimited amount of money, right? So Bernanke can have, or who is now? Yellen is the head. Uh, she can have any amount of money with probability. This doesn't make sense because the amount of money is infinite. It doesn't, it's impossible, say, zero dollars, one dollar, two dollars, that all these value are equally likely because the probability would have to be zero, right? Um, there is no probability distribution on an infinite set uh, that uh, uh, satisfies this property. Okay, so that teaches us that, uh, you know, that uh, probabilities is kind of something pretty slippery. And um, we should be careful. Okay, so uh, let's go back to algorithms. And let's see how probability operates in practice, right? For, with uh, randomized uh, algorithms. So and what's, what's the extreme value for the power? I mean, so the extreme values are one dollar and two to one oh, to a hundred and one dollars. So how are you supposed to know the extreme? Yeah. Well, I have to tell you. 
because only then the problem becomes meaningful. I cannot tell you all the values are equally likely if I don't tell you how many values there are, right? Because if there are 16 values, probability is 1 over 16 for everything. But you cannot have infinitely many values uh, with equal probability because if probability is p, you would get this, this would either diverge or be zero. So in order to make the problem meaningful, I have to tell you the range because only then equally likely makes sense. Okay, so given n elements, the task is to select the i-th smallest element. This uh, problem is called usually order statistics. Don't ask me why, but that's how it is called. So in particular for a, for i equals to 1, we get the minimum. For i equals to n, we get the maximum. And for i equals uh, floor of n plus 1 over 2, you get the median. Okay? Now, both, medium, both minimum and maximum can be found in linear many steps. You just go through the array and you keep the largest element you have seen so far. Um, but how do you find the median, right? And uh, this is interesting problem because it also incorporates one theme that will appear over and over in algorithms design, especially when we do dynamic programming, that it turns out that more general problem is simpler than particular problem. So if you just ask how to get a median, it's much harder than if I ask you how to find in general for every i the i-th smallest element, the i-th element in order. Of course, without sorting it because you cannot do it in linear time. Okay, so um, if you sort it, that becomes trivial, but it costs you n log n many steps, and the point here is to do it uh, in uh, uh, linear time. And what we are going to show is that there exists both a, a randomized algorithm that runs in linear time and also fully deterministic algorithm that runs in linear time. So one would wonder why would we bother to do something in a randomized way if we can do it with the same time bound in a deterministic way, what do you think? What would be the reason now that you studied a little bit the master theorem and the asymptotics? Constance. Constance, excellent, brilliant, exactly. So even though both algorithms will run in time C times N, C for randomized algorithm will be minusculous compared to the C for the deterministic algorithm. And lo and behold, in practice, uh, deterministic algorithm is not used at all. Uh, randomized algorithm uh, is uh, always outperforming it. So, I mean, of course, whenever uh, something is expected time, right, this is kind of tricky um, because this guarantees you only that on average uh, the, the performance will be good, but in any individual case, uh, the performance can be bad. So let's see, let me ask you a following problem. Okay, so for example, you have two people. One is a married person and his wife tells him if in two months we don't take a vacation, I'm going to divorce you, okay? The other guy is not married, uh, and uh, she says, if you are late uh, for our date tonight, I'm breaking up with you. Now, both guys have a choice of a very fast randomized algorithm whose average time is uh, very small, but it, say, 
uh, linear, but it can run, say, in quadratic time on some instances. Uh, which of the two will these two respective people choose? So assume, say, that uh, each time you run the algorithm, it takes, say, one day. Uh, and you have to run for, uh, say, 90, 90 instances of this. Uh. So who will choose the one, uh, the one that uh, his wife told him, uh, I'm divorcing you if you are not, uh, if you don't take vacation in 90 days, which one he will he choose? Uh. He will choose exactly the one that on average runs well because all what he cares is that some total over these 30 or whatever many run, 90 runs, that some total is small. And there the expected time will matter. But if uh, you want that, you want to be guaranteed that uh, today my instance that runs one day will actually finish at one day and not run for three days, right? Then you choose one that has uh, uh, guaranteed uh, uh, worst case performance. Uh, so in general, in most applications, we uh, care, well, we care in most applications with average or expected run time, except for what's called uh, real time applications, right? If you have uh, a computer program that, uh, uh, you know, steer, you know, controls an airplane. And if it uh, runs fast in uh, a thousand instances, but on one instance it stalls. Uh, one instance is one too many, right? So uh, for some applications, uh, um, the average time is not good enough. Okay, so that's the story why we are looking at both. So problem given an element, select the i-th smallest element. And the idea is divide and conquer, or essentially this is just one half of the quick sort algorithm. Why one half of quick sort? How do we, um, how does the algorithm operate? You choose a random pivot from the array, and then you split your array, and this can be done, as you will see later, a pseudocode very efficiently. You split the array so that everything on the left is smaller or equal than pivot, and everything on the right is bigger than the pivot. Now, quick sort would now take a pivot from here and the pivot from here and keep doing that. But since uh, we are here interested only in finding i element, we operate only on one half of the array. Which half? Uh, well, uh, we uh, count the number of elements that are on the left of the pivot, right? This will be p minus, q minus p plus 1. And we compare it with i. If i is equal to k, we are done because that's exactly our pivot because um, this many uh, elements, also all the elements, precisely k many of elements are smaller than the pivot. If k, if, um, if i is smaller than k, where should you look then? Exactly. If there are more elements than i here, you should only look here. But if uh, i is uh, bigger than k, right? If uh, uh, i is bigger than k, then you will look only here. But which element here you are looking? Uh, you are checking out this many elements, right? So, uh, in the other case, you will uh, look for i minus k elements because you are throwing away uh, k elements. So here is the, the algorithm. You iteratively, uh, you just keep 
splitting the array and looking at uh, one half only. And now we have to figure out uh, how fast is this algorithm. Uh, when you do the splitting, what is the worst case? Uh, that all numbers are smaller than the pivot or all numbers are bigger than the pivot because in this case you can eliminate only the pivot, right? So, and if you are unlucky as a pivot always to pick the smallest element among those that are left, then in fact your algorithm will run in quadratic time because every splitting takes n many steps to shuffle elements around. And at each uh, round of iteration, the number of elements drops for one. So the uh, total complexity is n plus n minus one and so forth, so n squared. Okay, so this is the worst case performance. But clearly, if you pick your pivot randomly from the array, um, this kind of situation is extremely unlikely to happen, right? So what we want to do is, first of all, we will assume that all elements in the array are distinct, right? What happens with uh, our algorithm, for example, if all elements are equal? Uh, how fast will it run? Uh? Hmm? It will be, of course, n squared because you will be dropping only one by one, right? Uh, but we will see how to fix that so that this uh, actually is not a, so that uh, the algorithm becomes immune to lots of repetitions. Okay, let's call a partition balanced partition. If the ratio between the number of elements in the smaller piece and the number of elements in the larger piece is at least one to nine. Uh, is this correctly worded? Is at least, uh, I, uh, this is not precise, that it should be no, that the balance, that one side should not be more than nine times the other, right? Namely that each of the sides are at least one ninth of the, or one tenth, right, of the whole. So this is a bit confusing uh, how I worded it here. So what is the probability to get a balanced partition after you choose a pivot? Uh, what do you think? So here is your array. Maybe I should, can motivate you to study uh, randomized algorithms by telling you that uh, maybe I shouldn't be spreading rumors, but what the heck. Uh, one of the professors at Berkeley who taught statistics, Lester Dubbins, he made a fortune, how? By gambling. <laughs> Don't try it at home though. Okay, so here is, here is your array. Yeah? What is, if I pick the pivot at random, what's the probability that the partition will, be, will not be balanced? To simplify things, let's imagine first that the whole array is sorted. Uh, what is the probability if I pick an element at random that the partition will be unbalanced. Hmm? Yes, so it will be unbalanced if I choose here where I have one tenth of the elements or if I choose here also one tenth of all elements. So lo and behold, uh, it will be, uh, so to be balanced, 
So probability to be balanced, assuming they are all distinct, uh, is uh, 8 over 10. So it's a pretty large probability that the uh, partition will be balanced. Uh, no, no, balanced means that the uh, ratio, that the small part is at least uh, one tenth of everything. So that they are in size at most one to nine, right? It's, so it's not really, it's kind of liberal definition of balance. Maybe I should call it not terribly in, unbalanced, but that's a bit of a mouthful, right? Okay, so probability to get a balanced partition is, uh, oops, is, is, is uh, um, 8 over 10. So let us find uh, the expected number of partitions between two consecutive balanced partitions. So assume that I had a balanced partition, okay? And then I pick my pivot. What's the probability that after a single pick I'll get a balanced partition? What's the probability? 8 over 10. So expected number of, uh, uh, expected number of uh, picks is uh, 8 over 10, just one single partition. What's the um, probability that I'll need uh, two uh, picks? Uh, so first I fail and then I succeed. Uh, what's the probability that I first fail and then succeed? Uh, yes. Exactly, so two tens times eight tens. Plus, what's the probability that I'll have to do three partitions? Exactly, so three times two tens squared times eight over 10 plus four times two over 10 cube times m, 8 over 10 plus ad infinitum, right? So we have to now sum up this. And this happens very often. Uh, these are Poisson trials, right? So uh, this type of uh, sums will be ubiquitous. Uh, in randomized algorithms, so we had better figure out how to sum, sum this. And there are two ways uh, uh, how to do it, and they are both worth uh, looking at uh, so that uh, we figure out how to sum this. Why? Because obviously I can take 8 out of 10 in front of everything and then have uh, Right, just this sum, which is uh, this sum here. How do we sum that? Uh, the first kind of way is to triangularize it. Uh, what do I mean by that? Voila. This sum can be written as first D sum, so this is just a geometric progression everywhere the coefficient is one. But here I have two of these, so I need one of these. Then in this sum, I will have, in these two sums, I will have these. And you can see, so if I sum vertically, I get precisely these. So sum of all of these sums is precisely what we get, what we need, right? Is this clear? This one? So what's the probability that after immediately, well, after just one partition, I get a balanced? This is 8 over 10, right? Now, what's the probability that I will have to do two partitions? This means once I failed and then succeeded. Probability to fail once is 2 over 10 times probability to succeed is this. Sorry? Which, these two? Because it's, what is the expected time? Sorry, the expected value. 
So uh, expected value of a random variable x that is discrete is some i goes from, uh, say, 1 to infinity. Um, value i times probability of uh, value i. Right? This is the expected the definition of expected value. Expected value is when you sum up possible values weighed, weighed by the probability, right? Just the first moment, right? So, for example, if, uh, uh, if we gamble, right? Um, say probability uh, to, to win is one half and I get a dollar. Probability to lose is also one half, but I lose two dollars. What is my expected value uh, if I repeat this gambling lots of lots of times? What's the uh, what's the average uh, gain or loss per each uh, run? It will be right, right. So it is. Uh, the probability is one half times one plus one half times minus two, uh, so minus one. So that's exactly what you have here, right? Okay. Now, if you uh, if you compute this, uh, what's the trick here? Well, summing it this way is extremely easy, right? It, they are all just geometric series, so the sum of the first one is 1 over 1 minus uh, the ratio Q. So this is uh, uh, 1 over uh, 8 over 10, which is 10 over 8. Here, if I pull out two tens, I get this. So the probability is two tens times this. If I pull out here 2 over 10 squared, the probability is 2 over 10 squared times 10 over 8. And now if I sum vertically here, I get 10 over 8 times the very same uh, geometric progression. So lo and behold, the result is this, right? It's 10 over 8 times 1 over 1 minus 2 tens, and this is 10 over 8 squared. So the expected value is then 10 over 8 times 10 over 8 squared. So this is 125 over 64, which means on average, how many trials do I have to make before I hit another balanced partition? On average, there will be only two trials, right? But now I can compute very easily the the average run time uh, because during the first trials, the, the, okay, so you see, even if the partition is unbalanced, it will drop a little bit, uh, but I ignore that. Uh, so if um, the partition is uh, unbalanced, I get uh, angry and I say, well, this costs me N. So certainly it costs me n plus something that at most n plus n minus 1, but it costs me less than 2n, right? So now, uh, and in the very same manner, after a first uh, balanced partition, I have only 8 over 10. This is my size of input, and the expected uh, number of these is also 2. Then I'll have at most 2 when the size of my array is 8 over 10 squared times n, and so forth. And when you sum up this, you get 10n. So the expected runtime is only is smaller than 10n. So the, my algorithm, in fact, runs in linear time. So uh, this is a digression. Uh, 
Another way of computing this without breaking it into this triangular matrix is, is you simply call this S, right? Uh, what do you do uh, next? You can represent this as one geometric series plus this which is, uh, uh, let me see, am I messing up? Here, not two, uh, yeah, yeah, so I have two of these, uh, voila, two of these here. I have three here, this is two plus one. I have four here, this is three plus one, and so forth. But now notice, so this part uh, here is just my geometric series, so this is one over one minus two to the n. But if I pull out two to the n, I get precisely what I started with. So I get an equation that S is equal to 10 over 8, right? Um, times uh, S, right? So I get the expected value is, uh, let me see, what did I, where is S? Uh, how did, uh, did I miss a step here? Uh, ah, here it is. So notice, so this uh, uh, produces this sum. This is just sum of the geometric progression. I pull out 2 over 10, and this is precisely S. So I get equation S equals 8 over 10 plus 2 tens of S. And if you solve this uh, linear equation, you get the same old answer. So that's another trick how you can sum up this. And when you do analysis of randomized algorithms, you are often stuck with estimating sums of this sort. So uh, just uh, take a look how this is done. It's really uh, a simple but very useful trick, and you will see it many times in what's to come. Okay, where did we tacitly Yes. This? Yeah. Because if you look at the formula, we pulled it out uh, here, right? All of these, so this is uh, success. This is failure success. You always have iterated failure times success. Yeah. Yeah, so you take it out, and now this is 8 over 10s. Yeah, had 10 on oh, did they flip it? <laughs> Gee, what an embarrassing mistake. Are, let's see. So, so this is S, and uh, so this is S, and uh, then I say here, where is the, oh, it's 8 over 10, oh, shoot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> is it really, did I mess it up so badly? Let me see. I guess you are right. Uh, gee, this looks like a two. Yeah, you know, I'll check it back home, but uh, you might be right. Uh, okay. Uh, we learn on mistakes, our own as well as for us, of other people, right? So, so uh, check this calculation. Oh, I forgot to tell you also, important thing. Whenever you find a mistake, so you get extra credit for this, send me an email. Uh, so the point, I always offer extra credit uh, for any type of mistakes or even simple typos, uh, right? So whoever discovers, uh, the first to discover a typo or God forbid a mistake like something embarrassing like this one, uh, you send me email and I'll of course correct it and record extra credit and this can push you uh, above, uh, you know, if you're short a few points from HD, you can, uh, it can push you above the limit. 
or in any case, it increases your, uh, your grade. So uh, this way, you have an incentive to actually read these notes, and it took me forever to type them, so you had better read them, okay? <laughs> okay, now, where did we tacitly assume that all elements are distinct? Uh, It is 10. Okay. Okay, so the homework is verify the calculations, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, what's a big deal to ask you people just uh, test your understanding of the material and my misunderstanding of the same. Okay, so where did we use the assumption? Yes? Um, when you said that the probability that the balance is Exactly. Probability, when I said that the probability is uh, 8 over 10, this assu I assume that there are no repetitions otherwise if there are repetitions, this, of course, changes. For example, if all are equal. How do we solve this problem in quick sort? Quick sort also needs this fix so that it runs in n log n time, even if the array has huge number of repetitions. So how do we, what do we do both here and in quick sort? You take the pivot. And everything smaller or equal than the pivot you put on the left, everything larger or equal or larger than the pivot on the right. If you have lots of values that are equal to the pivot, they will all go to the left. And the array and the partition becomes unbalanced. How do you fix that? But without destroying the tightness of the loop in both quick sort and in this algorithm. That's too complicated. <laughs> How would you do it? Uh, uh, kind of, you pick one pivot and, yes? Okay, so you can either randomly choose, but you don't, ha you know, calling a random number generator is expensive. You can just keep a flag, and each time you hit the pivot, uh, uh, if, uh, if the flag is one, it goes to the left. If flag is zero, it goes to the right, and you flip the, the flag each time. So you make sure that it will, uh, that the elements will go, half of them will go left, half of them will go to the right. And uh, now even if all are equal, you are guaranteed uh, good performance, and lo and behold, uh, here, this asks you to modify run select, but I thought, ah, okay, so this is your homework problem. So modify run select so that uh, it doesn't suffer from this problem when you have. Now, in 1972, uh, the li a linear time algorithm for order statistics was found, okay? Now, the fact that these are the most famous names of computer science. So it took one, two, three, four, five computer scientists to screw the ball, okay? So five great names it took to produce a deterministic linear time algorithm for order selection, right? And the idea is really brilliant, but unfortunately in practice it doesn't work that well and this is what we want to investigate. Ah, so we have to switch to another set of slides. We have five minutes, just enough to start to give you an idea. Okay, so let us look at Uh, where is it? Where is it? View. Okay, linear time, old order statistics. So what we want is, uh, 
we want to find a linear time deterministic algorithm that finds the ith element. And the trick is brilliant. So this is the idea. Our splitting algorithm, just uh, with randomized pivot, runs well whenever pivot is neither too small nor too large. What would be the best pivot of all? Exactly, the median would be the best. So what we are going to do, we are going to use exactly the same algorithm except when we need the pivot. We will call the very same algorithm to produce the pivot. But to do that, you have to call the same algorithm on a significantly smaller uh, number of elements, right? And the idea is uh, you simply split the numbers in groups of five. And then you do the following. You order elements of each group and in, in an increasing order by brute force. So every group, there are only five elements. So clearly they can be all, so the ordering is not between the groups. Only each group is say sorted, okay? Now what you do is, uh, now you isolate uh, this middle portion. So these are the medians uh, of each group. And lo and behold, uh, the number of elements here is only one-fifth of the total number of elements. Uh, so I can now call the very same algorithm to find the median here, and then I proceed exactly as before, right? Um, so it is, so essentially it's absolutely the same as run select, except how we choose pivot, right? How do we choose pivot here? We split all the elements in group of five, we find the median of each group and then we call that very same algorithm to find the median of uh, these uh, uh, medians of the groups of five. And how fast is then such an algorithm? Well, let's compute. Oh, okay, so what you do, this will be a recursive algorithm. Okay, so that's actually an important point. What is the difference between evaluating n factorial in the following way? One times two times three times four all the way times n. And evaluation that says n factorial n factorial is equal n times n minus 1 factorial. So you can clearly compute factorial recursively like this, or you can simply say you can have a loop that multiplies this. Which one runs faster and why? The second one runs faster. Why is it so much faster than the first one? Yes. No. You see, how does this operate? So computer says, okay, I have to compute n factorial. That's n times n minus 1 factorial. But I don't know what n minus 1 factorial is, so I go into subroutine of computing n minus 1 factorial. Uh, yes, yeah, so what happens when, uh, when you, you have to abort the computation here and to start computing this? But this is n minus 1 times, and again, you have to abort computation. And com How does a computer uh, do recursion? Stack. stack. So when it has to interrupt, push everything on the stack, the whole snapshot, and then here it will be horrendous amount of traffic on the stack, 
while this is just iteration. So this is essentially the distinction between genuine recursion and uh, iteration, right? Now, is it true uh, that everything that you can compute by a while loop is the same as what you can compute with the for loop? So what's the difference between while uh, and then condition Q do such and such and uh, for n equals 1 to 100 do such and such. What is more powerful? While loop. What is the example of a function that is computable with uh, a while loop but is not computable with for loop? Uh, 